Hey guys, this is Tim. Welcome to Conversations with Christians. This is the channel where we help give you the confidence to gay engage in dialogue, to grow as a disciple, and to equip you to defend the historic Christian faith. So it's a little bit late right now. Uh, it's close to midnight. I'm tired. I've been at a conference the past couple of days, and tomorrow is the end of it. But I've got some things that I'm kind of excited about, and I want to explore a little bit, some thoughts I want to share, some of my big takeaways. So over the past uh, year in an intense fashion, year to two years, uh, what have you, I've been on this personal journey to really try to better understand, you know, what is worship? What are my presumptions uh, about worship? Uh, what does the Bible want from us in terms of corporate worship specifically? I know Romans 12 talks about all things that we do are worship, should be worshipful into the glory of God, but there's a separate category there that is corporate worship. When we come together, as the church. And so I have been at the sing the, the, the Gettys put this on the sing the sing global sing global 2022, whatever it's called the sing conference, uh, for the past, uh, past two days. And it's all about worship. And the theme this year has been liturgy, which liturgy alone has really been a, a foreign word to me and my upbringing in the church until this past year, really. So I've been excited to kind of explore what that is uh, a little bit. And I actually got two books to kind of help me with that. Um, this one is called Be Thou My Vision, a Liturgy for Daily Worship. And the author, um, Dr. Jonathan Gibson, wrote this through COVID as he was trying to enhance his own personal devotion. Um and he came up with these uh, liturgy structures featuring, featuring some hit, uh, prayers from historical Christians and things like that. And, and, and he spoke a little bit about, you know, why would we recite a prayer from, you know, that someone else wrote and the value that, that's in that. And I have a new appreciation for that. And I'm not going to get into that, explain all that um, tonight. There's something else uh, I want to talk about, which is hymns and a new band that I'm excited about that I think writes him. So I got uh, Be Thou My Vision. I'm excited about this one. And this one's pretty neat. Uh, going to be a pretty neat resource for me too called uh, Reformation Worship. And this is a collection of liturgies uh, in the Reformation era. So all different kinds of uh, different Christian leaders um, in the, you know, the first 100, 200 years following the Reformation and the liturgies that they utilized as a part of their worship services. So Martin Luther's got stuff in here, Calvin, uh, many others. So um, I think this is going to be a helpful aid for me as I seek to um, add more liturgy to my personal devotions as well as some of the, uh, the small worship services that I have the privilege to put together. Um, but one of the questions that I really had going into this and has been on my mind lately is, what is a hymn? What makes a hymn a hymn, and why is singing a hymn important? Uh, because I felt that it is important, and but I'm struggling to articulate it and really understand what makes a hymn a hymn, as opposed to you know some contemporary Christian songs that we hear on the radios and that we might be singing in church as well. Um, the first thing I want to put out is is let's talk about stuff that that is not accurate. So a hymn has nothing to do with the age of the song. Okay. A hymn is a particular genre that we're going to explore a little bit in just a second, but it has nothing to do with how old the song is, which is kind of what I used to feel like, at least on a perhaps subconscious level. When we, when we would hear people say, I really miss hymns or things like that. And uh, I know I've been guilty of kind of shrugging that off and thinking of, oh, that's just someone saying they miss like their old familiars. But uh, while that may be true in part, um, there is more of a richness there about what makes a hymn. Um, it has nothing to do with the kinds of instruments that support it. So a hymn could be uh, banged out on an organ. It could be plucked on a banjo. Um, or it could be used with supported by whatever instrument you think you could come up with a synthesizer or any other, uh, something else crazy and obscure that doesn't define a hymn. Um, so I, as part of this concert, I was introduced to this band, uh, a worship band from Australia, which kind of like made me wary, as you can imagine for some other reasons, which was shame on me <laughs> for that. But, um, they are a very good band. They're called City Light, and I'm excited for them. I'm excited to listen to more of their music, and I'm excited for 
what they're going to do for Christian music and for congregational singing in the years to come, hopefully many years to come. Uh, but I, I attended a, a breakout session where they talked about was kind of behind the songs, I think was the theme. And they talked a little bit about what they do. And the Gettys, Keith and Kristen Getty, who put on this con this conference, and they, they've written In Christ Alone and other hymns. So hymns, these are modern songs that would be contemporary in terms of when they were written. And yet they have a very intentional, they are writing hymns. That is their goal is to write hymns. So what does it look like to write a hymn? Well, City of Light shared some things with, with me and the other attendees that I thought was pretty interesting and really helped me uh, have a better idea of what that is. So one of the things that City Light mentioned was they have a very long writing process. And they said that oftentimes in Nashville, um, Nashville is in the songwriting scene, not not more than just the specific location that we're in right now. Uh, songs can be written, you know, in a day and a half or less. We have songwriters on staff at these record labels and their job is to like bang, 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 pump songs out. Now, it doesn't always happen that way, but it's not unusual. And so they, they deliberately don't do that. So their songwriting process is around six months long uh, because they want to be very careful with the lyrics and deliberate with them. They want to take their time. Um, secondly, songs have a syllable pattern, and this was new and really interesting to me. So uh, in a hymnal, and I haven't gone to look at this, but that, I'll just take their word for it. In the top right is what they said is you'll see a syllable structure. It could be like 878 eight, or 887, eight, whatever it is. If there's a syllable structure in there. Um, and there's also, a, along with that syllable structure, a, a easily understandable and repeatable beat that goes along with it. And they use the example of... Uh, be thou my vision, just like the book I just showed you. And it would look like this. Be thou my vision. Or no, these was it come thou fount? I get those songs mixed up. Come, yeah, come thou fount. Come thou fount of every blessing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's eight syllables. I think it I think come thou fount is the eight, seven, eight. Um, but it's a defined syllable pattern and it has that rhythm. Okay, and so it has a, sp a particular syllable pattern combined with an easily understandable beat, and that is key to getting uh, to picking up on a, picking up a song quickly. So if you're going to design a song for congregational singing, with that, that that's the goal, you're going to do something like that that allows the human mind to pick up on it quickly. So you can only and I found I found myself realizing this during several songs that we've sung throughout this conference that I was unfamiliar with. And yet very quickly, I find myself not only singing along with it, but almost being able to predict where the tune is going uh, because it's so simple in that way. Um, we talked about the beat. Songs usually stay within a single octave. And so generally they said that's a rule for them. It's usually they try to keep it within a single octave uh, because just the average Church congregant isn't going to have that great of a range. Men usually have a smaller range than women, and they want to drive, you know, max participation in the congregation should be the goal. And so to do in order to do that, they keep it within uh, generally a single octave. And this is um, applied a lot in hymns. So if you go look at some sheet music and look up some classic hymns, they're not going to you know, the notes on the page are not going to soar up and down. It's really going to stay within a, a fairly limited range of notes, be it a full octave or just above an octave or, or whatever. Uh, but the goal is because they want people to sing along. Um, and now this is another interesting contrast that they gave again, as part of their strategy to intentionally write hymns, to intentionally write songs with the goal of congregational singing. Um, they design their songs so that they can, that it makes sense and it doesn't feel awkward for them to be sung in a small room of like six people so that you could sing them in a big conference hall. Like we have been doing this week, or you could sing them in a, a church auditorium of 300 people, or you could sing it in a room with six people, you know, maybe a, a, a secret church, an underground church somewhere that only has a few folks that you could sing this song, uh, and it would make sense and not sound awkward. And I think I try to think of a song that like that would sound awkward. And there's that one song, I'm not sure what it's called or who wrote it, but it's like, and I jumped out of that grave, you know? And I think of that line, it's like a yelling line. Um, you wouldn't do that song in a, like just at home in your living room. 
um, with your family. <laughs> so I thought that was an interesting contrast. And it's like, yeah, that's absolutely right. Like I couldn't sing that song there. But some of these other songs that City Light is, is putting out, we're gonna I'm gonna pull one up in just a second. Um, you could, and it would sound good, and it's within a reasonable range, and everyone can reasonably sing along with those. And the last point that I at least wrote down, they made a lot of interesting ones, um, was that the theology should be simple, should be true and simple. And what do we mean by simple? It's well, the song should, the theology in the song should def, be able to defend itself. You shouldn't need a, a pastor or, or a song leader or whoever to come by after, come back afterwards and explain what a lyric in a song meant. It should be evident in what it means. Um, it, not something complex to understand. Now it can hold, it can contain deep theological truths, but it should be clear in the truth that it's conveying. So one of the songs that I thought of is the reckless love. And there's been all kinds of stuff, you know, if you're familiar with worship songs at all and are keeping up with that, that's a very hotly debated song. Not a fan of it for a couple of reasons, but that lyric reckless love initiated some debate, you know, it's saying, well, God's love is not reckless. It's, it's intentional. And I would take that because obviously God's love is very intentional. I wouldn't describe it as reckless, but then the writer of the song comes out and says, well, that's, that's not really what it means. You know, what it, what I really meant by it is that and it's like, well, if you have to come behind the song and explain what the lyric means, uh, I, I think you're missing the mark a little bit there. And so they want, they want city light wants their songs to be clear. And again, this is not just all about city light. This is the context of the discussion that was going on at the conference. Uh, but generally I think these are guidelines for that. The Gettys would follow in terms of writing hymns, anyone, uh, so Bob Coughlin and sovereign grace, anyone that's trying to intentionally put out music to be sung by uh, congregations, I think are going to follow these guidelines. And it's just been amazing at the, at the, uh, at the conference, how we all, there's like 8,000 people there and we come together in these main sessions and sing these songs with fabulous world-class musicians on the stage. And yet we can always hear the, the congregation of the conference, uh, the voice, because everything that's going on the stage is there to support the voice of the congregation. And it's just awesome because you can pick up the songs fast. I find that I find I'm, I'm myself, I'm emboldened to sing louder than I normally would uh, because it just, it's such a natural feeling from the song. And I'm accompanied by all the people, all these thousands of people around me also um, projecting their voices and, and participating in it. And it's just amazing that the kinds of songs that they're singing, they're writing, draw that out of the audience. And they, and to further back that up, they always, almost every song in this conference has the lyrics or sheet music even on the screens uh, because they want folks to sing along. So um, I want to show a clip of City of Light and I, I think they've got some really stu great stuff going on. And I've just learned about them. So this is off of their YouTube channel, City of Light up here in the top left. And the song is called Yet Not I, Yet Not I But Through Christ In Me. And it's really a phenomenal song. And I'm just going to play about a minute of it here. Um, so let's check it out. And let's see if you can think of and recognize some of the, some of the uh, things that I just mentioned earlier. What gift of grace is Jesus my leave it at that. Just beautiful stuff. I mean, really, um, the songs are deep and they just draw that, that singing voice out of you. Um, they want you to, it, you want to sing along when you hear it, you're moved by the lyrics. Um, 
that God's truth is, is proclaimed to me, to myself, as I'm, as I'm reading the lyrics, as I'm singing the lyrics, I'm reminded of um, the vastness of, of God's attributes and the gospel and what he did. And um, I'm really excited about City Light. Um, I'm, I'm going to add them to my rotation more, no doubt. Um, the conference ends tomorrow, and, and uh, we've heard from Paul David Tripp and John Piper and John Lennox um, and several others so far. Um, John MacArthur is addressing the conference tomorrow uh, with some more speakers and music by the Gettys and others. Um, it's just been an amazing experience and really opening my eyes to the value and uh, of liturgy, of preparation for worship, both um, you know, a literal physical preparation as well, as well as a, a mental mentalness going into it and how worship services are structured and, um, different things, different types of prayers and things like that. So it's just been a huge, uh, benefit to me and a blessing to me. And I'm so grateful that I've been able to go this year. And I think I'm, I might do another video to talk about the conference as a general and what my, my takeaways are and what I thought was great about it. And, um, improvement recommendations if, if I even have any <laughs> I'm sure I can think of some um, but uh, yeah that's it this is Tim this is conversations with Christians I hope this has been helpful for you per usual if you have any thoughts on hymns or what makes good uh, congregational music I would love to interact with you in the comment section uh, on Facebook YouTube or Twitter with that I'll talk to you guys later